Welcome to Public Health IT. This will be a lecture on quality reporting. The learning objectives for the quality reporting unit are, number one, identify, describe important characteristics and components of useful healthcare quality measurement systems. Number two, identify the past and present efforts to transform medical practice through pay for performance initiatives. Number three, identify national group efforts involved in the establishment of quality standards, metrics, NCQA, NQF, etc., based upon claims and EHR data. Number four, describe how quality metrics are integrated, tracked, and used in EHRs, and describe real-world implementations in eClinical Works, EPIC, NextGen. Number five, Describe the use of EHR-based quality metrics in pay-for-performance incentive projects. And six, summarize the preliminary findings, conclusions, from the EHR pay-for-performance project and possible future directions. Measuring and reporting on the quality of healthcare has existed for over 20 years in the healthcare industry. Much of this aligns with current public health goals, but is not explicitly stated as most measurement focuses on service accountability. Purchasers of healthcare are interested in quantifying the quality of services being delivered to patients and to be assured they purchase the best possible healthcare. So how does one quantify the goodness in healthcare? In the 1960s, Avedis Donabedian codified many of the principles of healthcare quality measurement in use today. He proposed that every system is designed to achieve exactly the results it gets, and systems, such as healthcare, can be accessed through its components, structures, process, and outcomes. Most of us are already familiar with outcomes in healthcare. Avoiding disease and death are the simplest examples of outcomes. More complicated outcomes include cost of care and patient experiences. Processes are the actions taken to affect outcomes. Structure, such as staffing, facilities, health policies, influences, and in some cases, dictates the processes taken. Much of the early measures development for health focused on death rates in hospitals, key procedures, services that may not have any consequence, or association with improving health. Because not all medical efforts result in improved health benefits, there is a concerted effort to generate practice guidelines that are based on strong scientific evidence linking care processes and treatment to positive health outcomes, hence the term evidence-based medicine. The rationale in measuring the quality of healthcare services is based on the same evidence base. In developing or using quality measurement, there are several criteria to consider. The four areas listed on this slide will guide the development of new measures and selection or revision of existing measures. First, what are the populations that could be impacted? If it's not a large population, is the area being measured in need of improvement or has a substantial impact or benefit of high importance, rare but drastic consequence, such as death? Second, does the clinical intervention, process, or structure have a strong scientific basis associated with its benefit? The discipline of evidence-based medicine to identify known causes, treatments, services, or actions for example, hand washing to prevent infection, associated with proven beneficial health outcomes. Most evidence-based guidelines in use by providers are based on the results of randomized clinical trials, case control studies, and or a large retrospective analysis of a population database. Third, how easy is it to collect data to measure the aspect of care? Does the burden of data collection exceed the benefit? For example, cost to conduct chart review for every patient would not be worthwhile when those dollars could be used to deliver care. How reliable are the data available for measurement? For example, if there is an interest in whether a population of obese patients received counseling on diet and exercise, are patients better reporters of receiving counseling? Are doctors just as good or better at documenting in the medical chart that a patient received counseling for diet and exercise? In addition, what are the trade-offs between using a data source that is more accurate or reliable as opposed to a data source that may be a little less reliable but more feasible to collect? Fourth, is the measure or item broadly used by different sectors of the health system 
or adopted by specific areas or specialties? These considerations are important to consider when setting priorities for developing new measures or modifying existing measures in use. There are many existing uses of quality measures in the healthcare industry. Uses include improving care, comparing performance, or holding service providers accountable. Here are some examples of how quality measures are used today. The first grouping, improving the quality of care, focuses on gaps in care, where clinical intervention could improve the health of patients directly, such as making sure patients who haven't gotten a disease avoid it, also termed primary prevention. Examples include immunizations, cancer screening, or checking medication lists to prevent drug-to-drug -drug or disease-to-drug interactions. There are also secondary prevention measures in patients who already have a disease. Secondary prevention focuses on the outcomes of a service or treatment, for example, helping patients with high blood pressure avoid stroke or heart attack by lowering their blood pressure to a level identified by clinical trial studies to reduce the risk of stroke. The data used to track and trend these areas are often shared at multiple levels of the healthcare system to affect change. For example, health organization collects to track and compare across providers. In turn, providers may receive information on an annual basis to consider changing workflow or tracking down patients for return visits to better deliver a health intervention. Quality measures and the reports generated from the data collected to assess the performance of healthcare providers are also used by payers or purchasers of healthcare, such as health insurance plans, large employers, unions, or the government, or presented to consumers for comparing health plans or provider organizations. Several states have report cards that rank or compare medical groups or individual physicians. These scorecards are distributed in print as well as posted on the Internet. Examples are listed at the end of this session. Finally, a major focus that has become a part of quality measurement is the value of care, mainly the cost of care in association with health outcomes. This area is from the perspective of health economics and usually involves the tracking of access and use of services to assess whether patients receive what is needed and how much was paid to achieve the health results. There is also the use of monetary incentives, these are bonuses, paid in addition to the service fee or a salary, to encourage best practices or create competition to achieve the best possible results for patients. Referred as pay for performance, P for P, or pay for quality, P for Q, Incentives are used to focus on areas of care that have the most potential to reduce disease, mortality, and or costs. In other words, pay incentives to providers who help patients with high blood pressure control their blood pressure because patients with controlled BP will be less likely to have a stroke, potentially avoiding additional costs of hospitalization, surgery, and rehabilitation. Ideally for measurement to be effective, the measures selected would be standardized across various health settings or uses in the industry. For example, airlines measure their services based on on-time arrival or frequency of lost luggage. However, healthcare is complex and measurement is often non-standard. There are several organizations devoted to the standardization, development, and maintenance of measures for assessing quality of care. Two of the most prominent organizations are the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Hospital Organizations, also referred to as JCAHO, pronounced JCO, and the National Committee for Quality Assurance, often referenced by their acronym NCQA. JCO's measure sets are the most widely used by hospital organizations, whereas NCQA is known for Accreditation of Managed Care Organizations, MCO. Provider Recognitions Programs, such as Patient-Centered Medical Home, Diabetes Care, and Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set, HEDIS, pronounced HEDIS. There are also organizations devoted to obtaining endorsement and consensus for setting priorities of existing measures, or for the creation of new measures. These are the National Quality Forum and the Ambulatory Quality Alliance, formerly Ambulatory Care Quality Alliance. Finally, there are many organizations and sites that use or post measures and serve as resources. Finally, there are many organizations and sites that use or post measures and serve as resources to further encourage the adoption of the measures for assessing quality or driving improvement.
the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, has established and continues to maintain the most comprehensive clearinghouse of healthcare quality measures. In designing measures, it is important to understand the limitation of data sources and their reliability or appropriateness for use as an indicator. Administrative data, often referred to as the information collected as part of the operations for delivering healthcare, for example, payment, ordering of diagnostics or imaging, though not intended to report on the health status of the patient, can often be a proxy of what services were provided. An example where claims data may be a reliable and an appropriate source for measurement is breast cancer screening. For example, women between the ages of 42 and 75 are recommended to have a mammogram once every two years. Health plan insurance organizations can review their claim records on their members for the past two years and identify whether a female patient in the appropriate age range had a recommended screening. Clinical information, unlike administrative data, report on the result of a patient's treatment or diagnoses. For example, patients diagnosed with hypertension and their most recent blood pressure reading would most likely be in their medical record. This information either requires manual review of the medical record to abstract the patient's diagnosis of hypertension and recent BP, or if the provider has an electronic record, the information would need to be extracted by a software program. Though clinical information from the medical record is the most reliable source for reporting on a patient's health status, data extraction can be time-consuming and costly if done on a large scale. Surveys also provide another source of data for measurement when data are not captured through clinical records or administrative sources. For example, if we want to know whether patients were counseled for diet and exercise because of their weight, the most reliable source would be to ask the patient whether they have received counseling. Similarly, if we want to know whether doctors explained to the patient in a manner that was easily understood, only the patient can respond and provide feedback to this topic reliably. However, surveys can have limitations, as not all patients are willing to complete a survey and responses are subject to the patient's memory or perceptions. All three types of data sources provide different perspectives on the quality of healthcare and all provide valid information for reporting on different aspects of healthcare quality. As more and more healthcare providers use electronic systems to capture patient information for medical charting, billing health plans for services, ordering medications, tests, or referring patients to specialists, the use of electronic health records, EHR, for tracking the delivery of care offers quality measurement, a new approach for data collection and reporting. In New York City, a new bureau, the Primary Care Information Project, PCIP, was created within the Health Department in 2007 to launch a program to assist primary care providers adopt health information technology and to leverage information gathered at each site as a new method to track population health and delivery of clinical preventative services. The data model utilized by NYC's Health Department allows collection of population data without the burden of other data collection methods currently in use and results in more timely information that can help providers more rapidly respond to gaps in care or public health concerns, such as a flu epidemic. Much of the data in use by public health to track populations requires large-scale surveys, chart reviews, or sifting through large databases that can take a year or two to interpret with results or findings several years from the original services provided. The current data model at NYC Health Department is designed to receive automated quality reporting from multiple providers or independent medical practices using an EHR. Each EHR user transmit aggregated and standardized quality measures, either directly from their system or through a third party that aggregates patient information into provider-level reports before transmitting to the health department. Data is received both as aggregated practice-level information and summaries of the quality measures. For providers using a system that aggregates within their system, they are able to view a summary of his or her own performance on various quality measures using a feature known as the Quality Measure Report Tool. Results can be refined for a specific time period, facility, insurance type, or patient race and ethnicity at the discretion of the provider. The real-time display of quality measurement to providers offers a unique perspective of the provider's patient population, 
allowing the physician and the practice staff to be more proactive about clinical preventative services. Here is an example of the quality data transmitted to the health department. Patients are grouped by demographic characteristic, age, gender, and a diagnosis or health issue. These patients represent the denominator, the population of patients eligible for a recommended service or treatment goal. The numerator represents whether the patients in the denominator received the recommended treatment or met the recommended goal. The ratio of numerator over denominator is the percent of patients meeting the quality measure. In this example, data is shown about smoking status documentation for patients who visited four providers at three practices. The data can be reported as an average of the aggregate for the measure, or average by provider, or average by practice. Smoking status is one of 37 quality measures reported to PCIP, based on New York City's top health goals as part of Take Care New York. When quality measures are extracted from electronic health records, EHRs, a caveat remains. Having electronic records doesn't mean quality reporting accurately reflects practice performance. EHR data entry and data capture depend on how providers or staff document the visit or services delivered. This information hasn't been standardized, and each provider may choose to have a different workflow as to when or how something is entered. In this example, a study was conducted to assess where providers were documenting in the electronic medical record of whether a patient is a smoker, and if the patient is a smoker, whether they received advice, counseling, or prescribed medication to help quit smoking. The blue shaded boxes in the chart show what is currently captured through the automated quality reporting. The black shaded boxes display the number of instances the provider would have received credit for the quality report but instead is missed by the automated process because the location of the documentation is not part of the software programming for the automated quality report. Additional studies like these are needed to identify which measures can be used reliably to track the delivery of preventative services, as well as whether additional software development is needed to improve the user interface. Make it easier for EHR users to document in places that will be integrated into the quality reports, or to standardize the workflow or data entry process at the practice. Now let's turn our attention to how measurement can be used to drive change. For over 20 years, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, NCQA, has been tracking and trending the delivery of clinical preventative services in insured populations, and for almost every year of its annual report, some improvement has been observed, but more recently, they are reporting that the improvement of care has stagnated. As part of the 2009's annual State of Healthcare Quality Address, NCQA stated a concern that the quality world is flat. Why is this? What can be done to improve quality if over the past three years, little improvement has been seen for over half of the quality indicators tracked by NCQA? There are several hypotheses for how to bring about improvement, and most agree that three components are needed. Information at the right time, at the right place, at the provider's fingertips when he or she is visiting with the patient, for example, using electronic medical records. Information is integrated into the day-to-day -day routine of the medical practice so that healthcare providers can conduct follow-up with the patient or help the patient receive services in a timely manner, for example, using the EHR to track patients and their progress in staying healthy. In order for services that have a strong basis to improve health, in other words, evidence-based medicine, payment should be aligned with expected benefits and delivered consistently. Pay more for what matters. The following slides we will discuss the use of pay for performance, P4P, as a means to drive quality improvement. Though on the surface, paying more for what matters seems practical, there can be unintended consequences. Among P4P programs, unintended negative consequences can result such as providers focusing on easier-to-treat patients and thus increasing health disparities for patients that may be harder to reach or treat to goal. Other negative consequences of P4P can be design-related issues, such as having too many goals that are not feasible to achieve, only rewarding the very highest performers, thus discouraging bottom performers from trying harder, 
having a complex reward design so that providers are not sure what they are being rewarded on, making rewards too small, hence providers do not see the benefit of adjusting their practice habits to meet goals. The issues P4P can bring can also be potentially resolved by limiting the number of measures and providing a focus on areas that produce the greatest health impact. Providers like to know they are making a difference. Reward all efforts, especially if the provider population has not participated in P4P in the past. Providers appreciate being recognized as well as rewarded. Make methodology transparent and easily understood. Provide incentive amounts that matter. Reports have suggested at least 5% of annual net revenue. P4P programs can also avoid unintended consequences by providing feedback in the form of report cards or additional technical assistance for tracking and reporting on the measures used for obtaining incentives. A big question in P4P is what should a program pay for? As not all financial incentive programs have been successful in improving quality of care, the answer depends on what the effect is being sought with P4P. For example, if all providers are just transitioning into EHRs, it may make sense to encourage adoption and reporting as a first step. On the other hand, if all providers or medical groups have been participating in P4P for more than five years, for example California, then rewarding only the top performer may be needed to create competition and drive more practices to the top. Reward systems can range from simple to complex. The chart provides a simple overview of some of the P4P designs and the pros and cons of each. Low bar. Encourage participation. For example, pay for submission, reporting, collection, attestation. Medium bar. Pay for achievement of specific tasks. High bar. Performance in top tier compared to peers, greater than 90th percentile. Very high bar. Composite, zero defect measure, meet multiple goals at multiple thresholds. The following slides provide an example of a pay-for-quality design launched by NYC's Health Department. With funding from the Robin Hood Foundation and assistance of prominent public health and P4P experts, PCIP developed Health eHearts. Health eHearts is a pilot pay-for-quality, P4Q program combining public health goals of preventative and chronic disease management with health information technology to improve health outcomes. A study goal is to determine if incentives will sustain provider efforts in leveraging their EHR to track and improve the delivery of clinical preventative services with a focus on cardiovascular health. The Health eHearts program incorporates several of the design features discussed earlier to avoid unintended consequences. The program enrolled practices with a focus on adult primary care, had implemented an EHR, and were able to transmit aggregated quality measures to the NYC Health Department. A total of 82 small practices and 13 large practices were enrolled, representing over 400 primary care providers within NYC. Health eHearts selected core set of cardiovascular health quality measures as the focus for incentive payment, the ABCS, aspirin therapy for prescribing antithrombotics, blood pressure control, cholesterol control, and smoking cessation intervention. Heart attacks and strokes are the leading causes of mortality in NYC. A DOHMH study estimated that prescribing antithrombotics, aspirin, control of blood pressure and cholesterol, and smoking cessation intervention to appropriate at-risk patients would result in an estimated 5,000 deaths averted over the next 10 years if 500 providers delivered care at a performance rate of 80% across the four measures. Payment for Health eHearts uses EHR-derived data to pay per patient and pay more for harder-to-treat patients. Harder-to-treat patients include those with a comorbid condition, such as diabetes or ischemic vascular disease that makes treatment more difficult and requires more effort, office visits, and time with the provider. These were important design consideration for health eHearts, as many of the patients seen in NYC were living in medically underserved areas or high poverty, and the program leaders wanted to focus on reducing health care disparities. The payment design was intended to encourage all participants. This means for every patient that achieves the recommended goal, a payment will be made. For example, 
for each patient with diabetes or ischemic vascular disease, IVD, that is on antithrombic therapy, the doctor will earn $20. For helping a patient with hypertension control their BP to the recommended level of less than 140 over 90, a provider could be paid between $20 to $80, depending on the patient's other comorbid conditions or insurance status as Medicaid or uninsured. A provider could potentially earn up to $200 per patient if a patient had the target conditions and met all recommended practice guidelines. The program estimated that the average practice could earn $10,000 in one year based on community reports on the current performance on the ABCS and projected improvement if facilitated with an EHR. In Health eHearts, use of EHR-derived data to pay per patient and pay more for harder-to-treat patients addressed the goal of reducing healthcare disparities to improve delivery of preventative services with highest potential to save lives. Data collected through the auto-transmission process eliminated the need for chart review. The information transmitted was standardized across providers and practices. As part of the Health eHearts Pay for Quality program, quarterly report cards were delivered to providers as feedback on their performance. The intent of report cards is to help providers assess their progress in meeting the ABCS goals and have them act on the gaps identified. For example, of 300 patients with hypertension, 150 patients did not have their blood pressure controlled. Use the EHR to identify patients whose BP has not met goal and decide whether patients should return for another consultation, in other words, advise change medications. The report cards were also intended to remind providers they were being incentivized on these areas and potentially could earn more payments if they improved the delivery of the ABCS. In year one, Health eHearts enrolled 400 providers at 82 practices. These practices represented over 170,000 patients, more than 50% of whom were below 200% of the poverty level. As part of a randomized trial to determine if incentives could drive improvement, half of the practices were randomized at the beginning of the program to receive financial incentives. As data are still being collected, whether incentives made a difference in this program has yet to be established. After one year, the practices receiving financial incentive showed some improvement on quality measure scores. The average financial incentive earned per practice in one year was $12,000. Surveys conducted at the end of year one indicated that providers wanted comparisons of their quality data to citywide performance averages. In addition, provider requests for instructions on how to identify patients that did not meet targets indicated that many practices are not familiar with the EHR quality measure reporting tool capabilities. Health eHearts has now been extended to a second year. One hypothesis is that the staff and providers will be more attuned to meeting quality measures after receiving financial rewards when they completed year one. To test this hypothesis, participants in the first year of Health eHearts will be continued in the same randomization arm, financial incentive or quality recognition arm, for a second year. In addition, a new cohort of up to 100 providers already enrolled in PCIP will be recruited for year two have to be randomized to financial incentives. Both original and newly recruited Health eHearts participants will receive quarterly report cards and for the incentivized practices, the same payment schedule. In 2009, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, High Tech, authorized incentive payments through Medicare and Medicaid to clinicians and hospitals when they use EHRs to achieve specified improvements in care delivery. Providers must demonstrate meaningful use of the EHR, including use of core objectives and additional measures, which can also be referred to as structural measures. These objectives represent basic functions that all EHRs provide, designed to improve healthcare delivery. An example might be to record smoking status as structured data for 80% of all unique patients 13 years old or older. To document meaningful use, providers must meet 12 clinical quality measures from a list of 125, including at least one measure from each of six domains, patient and family engagement, patient safety, care coordination, 
population and public health, effective use of healthcare resources, and clinical effectiveness. These quality measures represent a few of the many measures available for providers to choose from, such as height, weight, BMI, and growth charts for patients 0 to 20 years old. Moreover, for Stage 2, meaningful use requires the eligible professional who transitions or refers their patient to another setting of care or provider of care to provide a summary of care record either a. electronically transmitted to a recipient using CEHRT or b. provide a summary of care record via exchange facilitated by an organization that is a NWHIN exchange participant or is validated through an ONC established governance mechanism to facilitate exchange for 10% of transitions and referrals. Lastly, eligible professional must use electronic messaging to communicate with patients on relevant health information, record electronic notes in patient records, be able to record patient family history as structured data, imaging results and explanation should be made accessible through a certified electronic health record technology, CEHRT, and lastly, provide the capability to identify and report cancer cases and specific cases to a specialized state registry. To assist providers in achieving meaningful use, regional extension centers, such as the team at PCIP, are already in place. This is the end of our lecture on quality reporting. In conclusion, this unit has identified and described the important characteristics and components of healthcare quality measurement systems. In addition, we discussed measures to achieve meaningful use and provided example on health eHearts payment systems. Finally, we described in detail the ABC of quality measures for rewards. As you can see, Quality measures are important because it provides key metrics on how to integrate, track, and use EHRs.